Hello guys, just a quick shout out to Engineered Labs, today's sponsor. They make these really cool acrylic periodic tables and they even have element 115. Well, not really, but they have all known radioactive ones. Check them out, link in the description. Traveling to the nearest stars in this century is possible, but only if we manage to achieve one of two things. A propulsion system that is able to burn for long periods of time at a minimum acceleration of 1G, or some sort of warp drive. Just to put this into perspective, if we had a ship like in the Expanse universe, we could reach speeds in the millions of kilometers per hour. Think about this, at a 1G of constant acceleration and burning for about 19.2 hours, we could reach Mars at its closest distance to Earth or 55,800,000 kilometers in just 32.5 hours. Compared to the current time, which is in between 6 to 8 months, that's a huge gain. Just to show you how much this really matters, the same acceleration would grant us a trip to Pluto in just 73.7 days. It took the New Horizons probe 9.5 years to get there. So rockets will help us a lot with the exploration of our own solar system, and it is a topic that I will be exploring in later videos. But what about other stars like Proxima Centauri, which is 4.2 light years away? Well, to reach Proxima Centauri at 40.14 trillion kilometers away, it would take about 683,465 days, or 1,873 years to be exact. But then again, Take into account all other problems related to traveling this far, let's face it, it's just not viable. The Alcubierre warp field would help us surpass the speed of light many times, which means that if we had a ship that could go 10 times the speed of light, it would take only 153 days to get to Proxima Centauri. Much more reasonable, I would say, but building a warp drive is not an easy task. Hello everyone, Subject Zero here. Miguel Alcubier is a theoretical physicist famous for the warp field theory. In May 1994, he published a paper titled The Warp Drive Hyperfast Travel Within General Relativity. However, his goal with this paper, contrary to popular belief, had little to do with warp drives. It was to show that a distortion of spacetime is indeed possible within the realms of general relativity and therefore we could travel faster than the speed of light. His objective was simple. He wanted to verify if there was a way to deform space in such a manner that its contraction and expansion would provide movement to a body inside the space-time warp bubble. The idea was to form a bubble around the ship and at the same time the inside of the bubble would remain untouched or flat as they say. We all know that huge masses can warp space. So the idea came from two factors, the ability for space to contract, like what happens with large concentrations of matter, and expand, which is what is happening with the universe. The only problem with his idea is that the transition from contraction to expansion requires a massive amount of energy, mainly focused on what they call exotic matter with negative mass. As complex as it may appear to be, in this case, since normal matter warps space inwards, that's why we have gravity, negative mass would warp space outwards. This is the key of his warp field theory. To better visualize this, think of it as the path of the ship inside a tube. In order for the warp field to work, it would contract the front of the tube towards the ship, bringing some distant point of space-time closer to it. And as it approaches the center, it slowly transitions to an expansion behind it. So space-time moves around the ship, and inside the bubble, nothing is moving, or space-time remains flat. Since there is no known limit to how space-time can contract or expand, in theory, anything inside the bubble can travel faster than the speed of light. All you need to do is increase the warp field. About 10 years later, NASA picked up on this project, and Dr. Harold White from Eagle Works stepped in to verify if the amount of energy necessary for the warp field to work could be brought down to something more realistic. His great insight was to oscillate in between states, or from contraction to expansion, by using a torus around the ship. 
He derived his calculation from the Alcobierre metric and described three main functions. The warp bubble shaping function, York time, which is the measure of expansion and contraction of space, and energy density. This is when we get this chart. What he proposed was that to decrease the mass necessary to make this work and have your ship traveling at 10 times the speed of light, you could in turn increase the oscillation of the torus using the York time function. But that comes at a cost. With a mass equivalence of Jupiter, you would have the optimal warp bubble conformation that would enable a ship to be located inside the bubble without any distortion or any harm to the ship. As you increase the oscillation, you diminish the total exotic mass requirements up to a point where all you need is about 700 kilograms of exotic matter, but the bubble would be so thick, pretty much destroying anything inside the bubble. That is when the second torus is introduced. With two oscillating tori, the thickness of the warp bubble can be controlled, allowing for flat space to exist inside the bubble, keeping everything intact. Even if we manage to make such ship, we still have to deal with other external factors, like for instance all the trapped energy in front of the bubble. Anything that is on the way of the ship route would get stuck in front of the bubble, so when you stop the ship, the energy would be released forward with high intensity. So one thing to avoid at all time would be to point your ship at the planet, or whenever you arrive, you will pretty much destroy the planet. Then again, this is getting more and more complex by the minute, and in the same fashion as Ocubier, all Dr. White attempted to do here was to bring the warp field theory to the realm of maybe plausible, and that is exactly what he achieved. One thing almost all scientists discussing this topic agree is that warping space is possible, or at least the numbers tell us that it's possible. Nevertheless, what is most likely to happen is warp field achieving subluminal speeds, like 10% of the speed of light. That is by far the most plausible scenario for the next 80 years. And 10% of the speed of light is a big deal. After all, to achieve the same speed using rocket technology, you would have to burn at 1G of constant acceleration for 35 days. Think about that. What could change everything, though, is antimatter. There is something about antimatter that we don't know. And most likely, it will take years for us to acquire a definitive answer for it. That is, how does it react with gravity? Is it repelled or is it attracted by it like anything else? Or better yet, what kind of gravitational field would large quantities produce? The thing is, we really don't know. But tests at the CERN facility with G-Bar experiment will give us some clues this decade. How antimatter behaves with gravity is still a mystery. And so far, no experimental direct measure has ever been successfully performed. The goal of G-Bar is to test the Einstein weak equivalence principle which states that the trajectory of a test particle is independent of its composition and internal structure when it is only submitted to gravitational forces. This fundamental principle has never been directly tested with antimatter. G-bar will directly measure the freefall acceleration, noted G, of neutral antihydrogen atoms in the terrestrial gravitational field. Then again, it will take years for us to gather enough quantities anyway. Whatever they will be able to produce this year, although helpful, will most likely be inconclusive in many aspects. But remember, what we are looking for is a concentration of mass that will allow us to expand space. But if the experiment is successful and antimatter turns out to be repelled by gravity, aside from revolutionizing everything, it could, in theory, be used as the exotic matter that Alcubierre described or at least open the door to a completely new field of physics. All right, folks, that's it. We're done here. 